uh, in this region. And you know, we did probably you know five, six times as much as what we could have done if it was just say the, the three of us from Cambridge uh, doing it on our own. And that's uh, really not to be not to be sneezed at. Uh, which way is the best way to uh, try? Uh, there we go. Okay. okay. So seeing the textbooks, uh, and I'm not going to go into great detail about this, and I really just wanted to get you to think about the contributing factors which control the data and proxy data that we get from the geoarchitectural uh, repertoire of and record uh, from different landscapes. And in the old textbooks, of course, it's always these top uh, um, factors, but to me, really, time and human activities and impacts is what we're really after uh, as archaeologists and what I'm always trying to relate to, not just think about nice soil sequences, but think about what are the, what's the interdigitation between human and climate uh, impacts, just like John Baptista was talking about. And this is a very old slide now. This is a recreated uh, hydrosphere next to an alkaline reed fen uh, landscape just south of uh, Cambridge. And I just want you to think about if you're plonked into that landscape as a geoarchaeologist, how do you actually begin to think about establishing a sampling strategy that will actually recover all these potential different landscapes you can see? We've got rough pasture, we've got good grass, we've got beginnings of deciduous trees, we've got gigantic deciduous trees, and beyond is chopped downland, so a bit like the low hills uh, around uh, the site we've been working on this week. And of course, you know, some of the proxy data, like molluscan work, for example, which I used to do, it would be no point in just sampling in these tussocks because it would just tell you about that rough grassland. Okay? It wouldn't actually tell you about what's happening 20, 30, 40 meters away. So establishing sampling strategies to get the variation at a relatively close spatial intervals is often quite difficult, and particularly in a landscape like we're operating in this week, which is gigantic by British standards. And then just think about, well, soils data as well. There's going to be different soil development in these different patches of landscape, depending on the vegetational complex. And then if you add human activity into the mix, so obviously there's clearance going on, piles of debris from clearance. This is grazed occasionally uh, for cattle, by cattle. Uh, you end up with different, if you like, uh, factors at play which can change the nature of soil development. And also, of course, you need to think about you know, what's the substrate, in this case it's limestone, what, how, what's the proximity to the groundwater table, what are the climactic parameters, and so on. And then the most important thing for us as geoarchaeologists is if we can find a landscape like this that wasn't just thin soils, but one that's actually, say, buried by alluvium or interdigitating with alluvium, like we've had at the site this week, will start to almost instantly get better preservation. So less physical disturbance by the 19th, 20th century landscape modifications. And that's really key. And just think, if you're looking at trying to find an example of an ancient woodland, they're few and far between. Even in Britain, we have some that maybe go back five or 600 years, but they've been managed for that whole time. So it's very hard to find modern and an outcome analogues uh, or analogies where you can compare the archaeological situation that's buried versus the modern landscape that we see today. And uh, Giovanni will probably talk about this kind of thing and it's what most micromorphologists have been largely involved with over the last 20-25 years is, is actually doing a lot of sort of ethnographic stroke experimental work to try and approximate potential situations that might have been, might have been in play uh, in the past and analyze those under known conditions so that we can find the micromorphological features that might relate to past uh, soil development. And I'm just going to whistle through all these. Fabulous buried landscapes in the Fenland of, of, of Eastern England. Uh, and, you know, I just showed this really because this is sort of typical of what Ryan, I think, is proposing. These, these dikes or these drainage ditches are cleaned every five to seven years in the Cambridgeshire Fens. So like you're proposing, 
We use them as a way of prospecting when there are random sloshes through the landscape. But you know, instantly I'm, I'm straddling a buried soil on a buried island that's got neolithic scatter material within it. So it was a very, very easy way of doing very quick prospection, uh, getting it getting on a map, uh, knowing where it is in height above sea level, and doing artifact collections from the, the buried soil, uh, which is the bit covered by, by grass, and doing some sampling for both mycomorphology, paleontology, not paleontology, but uh, palynology and, and, and macrobotanical uh, remains. So an extremely quick and easy way of, of geoarchological and archaeological uh, prospection. More buried soils, this time on the Channel Islands, humans with stacks of soils in the same landscape. But what we're really, I want to really introduce to you is this term, paleocatina, which is a, an important concept when you think about what are the signatures that are necessary to give us different uh, landscape or land use signatures through time within the same uh, geological and hydrological landscape. So you could take the sort of valley system where we've been this week and think, well, we're not just going to look at the site and its immediate environment, but we need to find the valley system it's associated with. We need to find the hard rock geology that it's associated with higher up the hill. We need to be able to find water flow deposits to give us the paleobotanical side of things. But can we find archaeological sites that are burying old land surfaces or buried soils at different time periods in the different landscape zones that you can see in that site environs? And then do the morphological work and geochemical work on it to actually work out you know, what are the different uh, land uses or landscape evidences which are showing up at those different time periods in that same landscape situation. And this is just an example, a sort of relatively hypothetical example from, from southern England, where you're getting the first soil development, you know, in the very early Mesolithic period, first weathering, first soil faunal uh, 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 and organic marker building, beginning to build up the soil. And by the time you've established a fabulous woodland on it, in the, by the, in our case, the sort of seventh millennium BC, you're beginning to get certain soil characteristics. Uh, which basically shows very pure clays interdigitating in the very base of the profile. And then when it starts to be really, really well organized, stable, long-term development under woodland, you start to get loads of pure coatings occurring in the very base of the soil profile, just above the substrate. And then what happens when you start to disrupt that by human uh, activities? All sorts of things start to happen. The nature of the clays that start moving become different. They become dusty and dirty, they start to mess up the rest of the profile, not just the very base of the profile. They often become thinner because of erosion, because of agricultural impact. And then depending on whether it's grassland or whether it's arable, you get different characteristics. So where we've done a lot of this work in southern England, in these major monument complexes that are highly known archaeologically, we know virtually nothing about landscape change. There's a lot of hypotheses. Uh, talked about, but what we found is that each one of these landscapes, so around Avery or around Stonehenge or Cranbourne Chase, further to the south, that it isn't just the textbook idea of full climax woodland developing in the Mesolithic, Neolithic farmers coming in, clearing it, and by the Bronze Age it's, it's a, a really intensive agriculture, and by the time you get to the Roman period there's loads and loads of, of, of destruction by uh, lots of hill wash and erosion because of intensification of agriculture. Each one of those patches of landscape, which are quite big, they're on the scale of what we've seen uh, here today, uh, suggest that there are things happening at different times. And it's possible that some of these landscapes are predisposed to being already quite open uh, in the Mesolithic through human management, uh, following uh, um, uh, migrating uh, deer in particular, and creating deliberately take, creating clearances to actually in, uh, allow killing grounds, if you like, uh, for uh, um, wild, uh, wild species at the time. And it's really, this is what we're hoping, if you like, that we've got the very beginnings of here at, at the, the, the uh, tell site we've all been working on. And if you could start to build up that picture by looking at the other ones we saw on the field trip today, then looking at some of the Bronze Age sites and looking for buried soils and Hollow channels where we can get good pollen data, 
to actually marry up the two sets of data through time in the same geological, hydrological landscape, you can then begin, hopefully, to talk some, something sensible about human impact uh, in these landscapes. And that's really what, as a geoarchologist for me, that's what it's really about on the landscape side. And if we can begin to provide that sort of through time context of change related to human activity, uh, then we shouldn't be doing, it shouldn't be in the business, really, okay? Uh, because it's all about, the, in, in essence, the, the human story. And of course, the great thing, obviously, you'll, you, you know we're keen on micromorphology, but but you know, it's incredibly good at teasing out micro sequences of change in every soil profile we look at. And if you start to build up enough of that, so you know, some of these projects in southern England, uh, we're doing you know, not just one or two profiles with micromorphological data, but you know, we're doing often hundreds of profiles to actually start to really build up a spatial picture through time of landscape change. And that's really what I wanted to, uh, to say without going into millions of examples, which obviously I could bore you for hours, uh, showing you all sorts of things from around, around the world. But that's, I think that's, I hope that's what we've begun, I think, collectively, to introduce you to the possibilities. Uh, and some of it being, as you saw, it's, it's not rocket science, most of it. It's like all archaeology, it's good, clear description measured description in the field, which is your basis for everything. And then the decisions about what to sample and where to sample, that could be more difficult, but it's almost always constrained by the landscape you're actually uh, involved with, uh, through its geological and hydrological context, if you like, and you have to cut the cloth to suit wherever you are. And, uh, and that's really, really important. Uh, and that's a, another thing that most archaeologists, or I think many archaeologists, forget about we often can't do everything that's asked of us because the preservation conditions aren't good enough. Okay? And don't never be afraid to say that and say, well, it's not so great on site because it's heavily plowed damage. We need to start looking at two or three hundred meters away down the valley where there might be some soils under alluvium, for example. Okay? So that's enough for me. Thank you. And thank you again, everybody. It's been a fabulous week. Thank you.